Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming. Uh, I know the social event was pretty successful, so uh, I'm even more glad that you made it. I uh, will try not to shout too much during the talk. Um, so before I go through the topic of this talk, first I'd like to sort of talk about something more important. Um, so my name is Mark Smith. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Nexmo. Um, I run the user group for Python in Edinburgh. I, my handle on most social networks is Judy2K for reasons that aren't as funny um, as you might think. Uh, I am known for writing silly Python code and then showing it to people for my own amusement. Um, and despite the Viking helmet that I kind of use as my, my general brand, I'm not a Viking or Norwegian or Scandinavian in, in any way. Um, so talking about Nexmo, uh, briefly, uh, we're a sponsor of the conference. Uh, you've probably sp maybe spoken to me on the booth. Uh, if not, and you would like to, come and talk to me uh, some point later today. Um, we've got REST APIs for sending and receiving uh, SMS messages and making phone calls. Um, can I just do a quick show of hands? Uh, we, we generally do this um, because not many people have heard of us usually. So before this conference, who had heard of Nexmo? Yeah, it's getting better. <laughs> Um, so my job at Nexmo is to maintain our client libraries uh, for Python and Java, and in my own time, I maintain a library for Go. Um, and so I think a lot about compatibility and maintaining compatibility, um, and, and just kind of what I, I, my job is really to communicate with developers and find out what they want and try and feed that back into our product pipeline. Um, so this talk really ended up not quite being about refactoring. It's related, but it's not quite about refactoring. If you do want to know more about refactoring, uh, I highly recommend this book. It's been around for a while. I think it popularized the concept generally. Um, it contains 72 refactoring recipes um, for kind of uh, modifying your code in order to improve the quality of the structure and the architecture of the code. Uh, it's very Java-centric, um, but it's got lots of experience in, in the pages of the book. Uh, it's got lots of good advice, but some of the patterns also don't really transfer to Python. I mean, Java's a very different language to Python. But the main theme of the book is to be prepared all the time to be modifying your code to keep it clean uh, and to allow new architectures to emerge as you kind of uh, discover them through developing and extending the library. What the library's not really worried about is whether you break your user's code. It doesn't worry so much about interfaces. It's, it's more worried about kind of uh, code that is kind of, you're allowed to change at any time. Now this, this isn't really true of libraries. Um, this talk is really about Python library maintenance, and it, it's got this assumption uh, that you have released code with two or more users, um, and so what that results in is you've got a one-to-many relationship. So if you break backwards compatibility in your one code base, your users, in order to upgrade, are going to have to change their code, and that's going to be many changes. So that's something that should be avoided. So this part, the other part of this talk is about hiding change from your users. Um, so it's, it allows you to change things internally without affecting your users in neg two negative ways. So what we're really talking about is keeping our interface stable while changing the code. Um, so the reasons you'd want a stable interface um, I mean, I think they're pretty obvious, but I'll go through them anyway, is, is really to keep your customers happy, to keep your, keep your users happy. Um, every time, if, if you keep breaking backwards compatibility, um, they're going to get unhappy in general because you're making more work for them. Nobody likes being given work that they, they didn't necessarily want. Um, and also, every time you break backwards compatibility, you're giving your users an opportunity to switch to a competing product competing open source library. So if they're going to have to rewrite their code in order to keep on using your library, why not just switch to the new hot thing? Um, and this has happened in web frameworks certainly a long time ago. Uh, frameworks uh, which I don't really want to name because I feel like I'm uh, maybe demonizing them a little bit. But um, uh, there was a big glut of frameworks about 15 years ago, and nobody was really sure what the right way to do things were, and as they learned, often they broke backwards compatibility, and really what ended up the successful frameworks, the ones that we're still using today, were really the ones that, that worried a lot about maintaining backwards compatibility with their users. So really, libraries only survive if they're stable, and that's why we want stable interfaces. So we talk about this idea of an interface, whoops. Um, what is an interface? Um, I think of it as the boundary of your code. So it's, it's, the, it's the, the code that your user interfaces with. So it's where your user uses your code. 
Um, and if you change it, it's where your user will be affected. And it consists of various components. Um, so the obvious one is a module. They'll, they'll be importing your module or package. So if you change the name of that, that's going to break things. Um, the thing we usually think about is that the module consists of classes and functions and methods, and that's our interface, our agreement with the user. Um, to go slightly finer grained, we've got the parameters that our functions and methods call. If you change the names, the expected types, return values as well, um, this is going to affect your user in negative ways. We've got global variables that are usually static, um, but potentially you might want to change them with something dynamic, um, and that's, that may cause problems. Uh, something that people often don't think about up front is exceptions. So if you change the names of your exceptions or the, the hierarchy of your exceptions, um, that's going to cause problems for your users. Um, we've got the structure of our code. So this is really kind of where your code lives. If you start off with a, a big um, single namespace and you've got a kind of utility function in there, your user might find it, decide it's useful, start using it, and then if you decide to tuck it away in a utils package, sub package later on, um, that's going to break your client's code, but it's not something you necessarily expected. And finally, this is a little bit of a silly example, but we've got bytecode as well. So potentially even changing your bytecode could cause problems for your users. So I don't know if people saw Sebastian Noack's um, go-to hack at the Lightning Talks a couple of days ago, but he's got a decorator that decompiles a function and modifies the bytecode and recompiles it again in order to allow you to use go-tos um, in the code. So potentially changing the structure of your code might also break um, your compatibility with your users. This isn't really something you have to worry about because really they've broken all the rules if they do that kind of thing. But this is really kind of the, the bigger topic of the talk is, is making an agreement with your customer. So ideally, interfaces, your, your deal with your customer is as strict as possible. I think of it as kind of one of these kids' toys. Um, so you've got the idea of, of well-defined objects passing through the, the wall of the interface. They're validated on the way in. Uh, you may call functions and methods um, with these objects. And then ultimately, well-defined, stable, well-understood objects are passed back or exceptions are raised. In the ideal world, it's impossible to refer to classes, methods, functions, or variables that aren't exposed by the interface. Uh, a couple of days ago, um, in Hinnick's talk, he used the analogy of ravioli, which I think is particularly appropriate given where we are, um, and the idea that, that your interface is like the pasta that keeps the, uh, the filling of your, your ravioli separate from the tasty, tasty sauce. It stops your, pasta, it stops your dish from just being a mess. Um, but the concept here, really, the idea, is that even if you're not publishing your library, if you don't, even if you don't have external customers, your code should be divided up this way. It's much easier to understand like small, well-contained code libraries. Um, so talking about strict interfaces, here are some things that are like that, like that definition of uh, a strict interface, like the toy. Um, and I, there'll be a few sniggers, I suspect, looking at this list of technologies, because none of these are technologies, apart from maybe the first one, that we particularly enjoy working with. They're all a little bit painful. If you want to define interfaces with J2EE, there's a, you, you essentially define your client code, your server code, and a third module that's shared between the two that is your well-understood interface. Um, with SOAP, you define a WSDL file, which defines, again, incoming and outgoing objects. So that you're defining your interface separate from your implementation. Um, and these are both, these ideas have been around for a long time. The dates on there are kind of 16, 17 years ago, 17 or 18 years ago. Um, but it goes back to Corber as well, which is a, a hideous technology. It's enormous and horrible to deal with, but that's um, 26 years old. Um, so these are, these are things that are like our, uh, getting towards our ideal world. Python isn't like that. Let's have a look at a quick example. So um, this is a bit silly, but I've um, imported requests. Um, and I'm just listing the stuff that's inside the requests library. I'm sure we've all used it at some point. Um, we've got a magic thing that begins and ends with a double underscore. Uh, we've got a private thing that starts with a single underscore. Uh, we've got uh, some things with interesting names like get, which is a function, compat, which is a submodule, and, mo and models. And, and it's not immediately obvious with some of these whether they're um, private or public, whether we're really supposed to be using them. Um, and something stupid we can do with it is we can import the, the module uh, we can then define a function, and then we can modify the request module that we've imported with our own get function. Um, and then anywhere else in our code base where somebody imports requests, so they get our modified requests, and when they call get, it doesn't make an HTTP request, it just prints out a, a silly message. 
But it gives the idea you can dig as deep as you want into somebody else's Python code and switch out things um, that they may not want you to. Um, and so we've gone from another like, appropriate seaside analogy. We, we've gone from uh, the idea of our library as having a kind of tough shell that's difficult to break through, that only gives you access to things on its terms, um, to what Python is, which is really just kind of a, a box of Lego. You can, you can reach in, you can grab anything you want, you can take it apart, you can put it together in different ways, and then put it back in the box. Um, so what we really need to do is kind of <laughs> build our own, <laughs> thank you. So we need to work with the tools that we have um, in order to uh, build an agreement with our users. So we need to make our interface knowable because we can't stop people from digging into our code, so we have to make sure they understand um, what we expect from them. And how do we do that? We've got a few conventions, um, and uh, so here I've got a private method. It, it, we know it's private because it begins with a single underscore. The single underscore doesn't change the behavior of the method at all. We can still call it. You can see the last line of code. I call it, it works. Um, but we know just by reading the name of the the method that it is considered to be an internal detail that we're not really supposed to call it from outside this code base. Um, so we should be using these. This is, this is something that you kind of get for free, an agreement with your customer that this is a private in implementation detail. What you sometimes see in less experienced developers' codes is that they've read a book, they've discovered that there's this double underscore prefix, and then they start to use that for, for private uh, methods especially. Um, and that isn't what this was designed for. This was designed to avoid namespace conflicts. So this does change the behavior of, um, of the class. It, the method name internally is changed, um, and it's just prefixed with the name of the class and a, and a single underscore. Um, so you can still call it. You haven't stopped people from calling it, you've just made it a little bit more difficult. And ultimately, if your user really wants to call that method, they're going to call it anyway. Although, by this point, they've probably copied and pasted the code into their own code base, so uh, it's a different kind of problem. And a third convention we have in the Python world is um, just to kind of move the code out of the way. So often you'll find in some quite uh, popular libraries, um, there's a public module or package at the top, and then there's a sub-module internally that really contains all the code. And then in the public module that is the thing that the, customer, the user is expected to import, um, they've just kind of imported the public interfaces, the public functions and classes from the private submodule. So it just puts it out of the way. If somebody imports your, your public module and then does a DIR, everything they see is something that they're expected to work with, and that's, that's good. So I recommend that too. But these are kind of, you get these for free. These are, these are conventions in the Python world. Something a little bit more expensive, but infinitely valuable, is documentation. Documentation is the primary way that you communicate with your users. And the Python ecosystem has excellent documentation, so much so that it's spawned a series of international conferences dedicated to the documentation, the Read the Docs uh, conferences, that I would say spun largely out of the Python community. And the reason documentation is so popular in uh, the Python world is that we've learned that users will use um, the interface that you document. We usually distribute source code, um, as our libraries as source code, so somebody can read the code, but you don't really want to. If you don't write documentation, users will read your code. If you don't write documentation, users will guess your interface and they'll get it wrong, which is not something that you want. So for documentation, um, I recommend uh, Sphinx or MakeDocs. Uh, MakeDocs is supposed to have a capital D. Uh, Dougal, the maintainer of MakeDocs, is sitting in front of me and has uh, warned me about this before. Um, I don't recommend auto-generating your documentation. Uh, it's a really bad idea. Um, by default, everything is going to be published as documentation. That's not what you want. You want to filter your documentation down to the things that you want your customers to use. Um, slightly related to this is type hints. So, I mean, it's a recent addition to the language. Um, I think it's still pretty controversial. Doesn't change the behavior of the code at runtime by default. Um, but it is used by IDEs to help users use the right types, ingoing types uh, into your functions and, and return types as well. It kind of it gives the user an idea of what they're working with. So, in general, I think they're a good idea. Whether they're worth the cost of maintenance is difficult to tell. But I'm trying it out in, an, in the Nexmo Python library to kind of see see whether that's something we want to expand and take forward. But once again, we're sharing an understanding with our users, which is a good thing. So in answer to our original question, what is our interface, uh, the answer really is code that's documented. Um, because that really is what the users will see, 
Um, it gives them no reason then to dig into your code, get confused about what they're supposed to, supposed to work with. Um, and so this is a good place to be. So once we've created an agreement with our users, uh, then how do we stop ourselves from breaking the promises that we've made? And the answer is testing. Um, so there's this famous uh, quote, uh, which although I've attributed it to Jacob Kaplan-Moss, he denies ever having said it. So really it's kind of, it should, be, should say anonymous at the bottom there. Um, so I would say there's a corollary to this, which is that if you're not testing your interface definition, then you don't have an interface definition. Um, and to look at the, the standard testing pyramid, the idea here is that at the bottom we've got unit tests. Uh, we want as many of those as possible, or we want more of those proportionally, because they're, they're quick to run, they're cheap to write, um, they're easy to maintain. And then at the top you've got manual tests, which are uh, heavy and slow, and you don't want to do those. So in the middle somewhere, I would say you want fewer than integration tests, but you definitely want to have your, your interface tests divided out. That means that when you find yourself changing your interface tests, you know you've changed your interface, which means then you need to work out what you're going to do later on. Um, you need to communicate these changes to your users. And the way you communicate changes to your users is through versioning. Um, I recommend semantic versioning. Um, so that the thing here is that uh, your major number, which is the first number in this, I mean, we've all seen this, um, but the major number indicates backwards compatibility. So whenever you break backwards compatibility, that first number changes. Um, and your users then know that this is going to cost them some effort to upgrade. Um, minor and patch numbers uh, are uh, less uh, aggressive changes and usually won't change uh, the compatibility with the user. Uh, this is documented in detail on semver.org, and it's on, they're on version 2.0.0 of the specification, so they're eating their own dog food. Um, along with versioning, we've got release notes. Uh, I recommend you check out keeperchangelog.com. Um, they uh, offer a, a guidelines for maintaining your release notes. Uh, they say that every release, you should divide your changes um, into a list of the things that were added, changed, deprecated, removed, fixed, or are security changes. So the two that we're really interested in here are changed or removed. Those are things that are changing backwards compatibility. So the things that we need to, we really, really need to make sure our users know because it's going to break their code. So although we're talking a lot about not breaking code, um, it is OK to ba break backwards compatibility, um, but you want to do it occasionally. I recommend keeping a branch of breaking changes and pushing them, uh, unless they're essential, pushing them kind of in a block so that you're not drip feeding changes to your users. That's, that's a pretty negative thing to do. And in general, add and add new functionality alongside the existing functionality and deprecate the existing functionality. So you're letting users know that they should be migrating their code. Have a deprecation policy. Um, I quite like Django's deprecation policy. Um, anything uh, that they mark as deprecated gets removed, in, apart from a couple of caveats, gets removed in the next major release. But you could leave it two releases so it gives the user more time to kind of adjust to the changes that they need to make. So the real theme of this so far is that Good engineering practices uh, allow you to make, uh, uh, allow you protect your users from change in your library. So documentation, testing, and versioning are things you should do. So I'm going to skim through some technical solutions now. Um, the last time I ran this talk, it ran over 40 minutes, so um, I'm really going to be uh, giving you some ideas. But there's a, I'll give you a link at the end of the talk, which links to some code that demonstrates all the, the examples that I'm about to give. Um, so the first one is pretty common. I suspect everybody in the room's used it at some point or not. You've, uh, you've got a class um, with an, a static attribute, so it's pre-generated, uh, and you want to change it to a dynamically generated um, value. Um, and the way to do this is to use the app property decorator, um, which just makes something look like it's a static attribute uh, lookup, but in fact calls a function instead, so you can generate the value at that point. So you can have it gen generated based on uh, network value or time or um, calculated uh, from other values inside the class. So that's pretty straightforward, but it's a good example of one of the things you can do in Python that you can't do in many other languages. Um, and the way that that works is down to uh, something in the, that you can read about in the Python documentation called the descriptor protocol, which I highly recommend. It gave me a real understanding of, of what's going on beneath the surface of classes and attribute lookup. So the next kind of refactoring thing you might want to do 
is to change the way that classes are instantiated. So this might be so that you only ever have one instance of a class, so essentially a singleton, um, or so that you have a factory. So objects that may be expensive to produce are pooled when they're not in use, and then you return something from the pool if there's one available, or, um, or, or you generate a new one on demand if there's not one available, or possibly block until one's put back in the, in the cache. Um, so in the refactoring book, this is actually called replace constructor with factory method. But the nice thing about Python is we don't need to do that. Um, so we can implement uh, the lesser used um, Dunder new uh, method. method. Um, and then inside there, we can either return a new class by calling new on the uh, superclass, uh, or we can look something up and just return that value. There's, there's no um, uh, kind of prerequisite that you have to create a new class when you, when you call a constructor, which is kind of neat. Um, so we can make these changes transparently to the user. They don't know that you've switched from instantiating each time to returning stuff from a pool. Um, you've done that under the hood, which is good. Uh, the third example is replacing functions with methods. So when I start a new module design, I tend to start with functions. I prefer those to classes generally, but sometimes what you find is you end up with some global state in your module, um, which then if you change in the module, it's, it's essentially a singleton value, and so you can't have multiply configured uh, modules. Uh, so really the way that you do that is to define a class inside your module and then instantiate that um, for the different cases that you have. Um, so if you've published your library already with these top level functions, um, that's kind of a problem. Um, but we can get around this because Python's got some pretty cool features. Uh, so this is the end result of this. So the idea is that you had a module uh, with the do the thing top level function, uh, and what we want to do is, is put it inside a class. Um, so to start with, we've created our class, we've taken, taken the top level function, and we've moved it um, under the app class. Uh, so this is great, we can now instantiate an app and we can call the method. But this is broken backwards compatibility, so we need to fix that. And the way that we fix that is we create a default instance of our class. Um, we can either make that a public thing or a private thing. I think it's quite nice to make it public so that you can, people can start to use module.default to refer to it. Um, and then what we do is the bit of magic where we take the method, um, which, which can just be assigned to a variable. So that's what we've done. We've assigned it to the global variable, do the thing, and now it looks like a function. It's not a function, it's a bound method on your instance. Um, and it's just quite a nice way. You would do this with each one of your top level functions that you've put inside the class. And finally, and this is a slightly silly example, um, but it's neat, and again, it, it, shows some, some, it shows how flexible Python is with being able to switch out certain types with other types uh, when necessary. Uh, so in this case, uh, I have a uh, module which I really want, want to replace with an object. Um, so this is the module, um, and it's got a single global variable in there called salt, and you can see it's static, it's number four, but somebody comes to us and tells us, actually, that shouldn't be four, that should be generated, that should be the result of time. Um, so uh, that's awkward, because people are already using our module, and they're calling module.salt to get it, or in, in this case, important.salt, uh, to get access to that value, and you need to generate it dynamically, so you really want to gen replace that with a function, but you can't do that, because that breaks your interface with your user. Um, and if it was inside a class, you could use the property decorator, uh, but you can't do that because they don't work on top level functions, they only work inside classes. Um, and so what we need to do is replace the module with a, an object instance. So this is like crazy stuff. You probably don't want to do this in your code, but I just wanted to kind of show how you might do this. Um, so here we've got a class called fake module because it's gonna pretend to be a module. Um, and then we've defined our property on it, so we can, if, if we had an instance of this, we can refer to um, the instance.salt and, and get back our value as if it was um, an attribute rather than a function. And then here we instantiate our silly object and uh, then we, um, we assign it to the module. So every module you've loaded inside your um, application is put into this dictionary in sys.modules. You can have a list. Um, you can list it at any time you want to and see the modules that have been loaded. But like many things in Python, it's mutable. So you can replace the module that's been loaded with an instance. Um, so now, anywhere in the code that uh, refers to this, oops, I don't actually have a slide for this, excuse me. Um, so anything that refers to that code um, uh, it will continue to work, but it will get back a dynamic value from this point on. 
So j just to run through some further techniques, really what this comes down to is understanding the Python execution model. And there's various of these magic methods and variables inside Python that you can use um, to replace one thing for another, to pre essentially objects pretending to be other types of objects. So we've already seen using Dundon U to change the construction um, of a class. Uh, we can make objects behave like iterators behind the scenes. This is how iterators and iterables work. Um, we can make methods, method calls look like attribute access using done to get. This is what property uh, uses behind the scenes. Um, we can make classes that act like functions by implementing done to call. So you, can rep you could ha replace global state with essentially an instance that's callable, which is kind of neat. So, um, we, and then there's manually extracting parameters. So we can be extremely flexible about how we extract parameters inside a function. So obviously normally you list the functions that you want. Sometimes you have an asterisk args to kind of collect random stuff that people might send into your function if you're particularly flexible. Um, but he's just shown me a number and now it's distracted me. It's completely thrown me off. <laughs> Um, so, uh, but we can be much more flexible about that. We can kind of define the rules of uh, what's accepted with inside a, a function and kind of almost deal with different, uh, different sets of function, uh, different sets of parameters that are provided. Um, so if you, were to look, if you were to look at the documentate, the low-level documentation for Flask, for example, almost everything in there takes asterisk args or asterisk, asterisk, kw args, and then it just kind of pulls that out the values that it needs to make the call, um, behind the scenes, um, and if you don't provide the right set, you'll get an exception of some kind to tell you that you didn't follow the rules that have been defined in the documentation. Um, many of these special methods are described in Dive Into Python, which is free and available on site, uh, online, um, and yeah, I highly recommend having a look through the list to see what's, what's possible. When using these tricks, especially the last trick, um, you have to be aware that every change you make has risks attached to it. And the more magic you use, the more risk you're really taking that you're gonna break compatibility accidentally with your users. Um, so just be aware. Sometimes it's better, to, often it's better to break code than to use magic. Um, so yeah, I, I would say generally default to the straightforward changes, but if you have a lot of users, you, that might stop you from making changes at all. So just be aware that there are, are opportunities sometimes to use a little bit of magic to, um, to help you in your relationship with your users. The use of exceptions in code varies wildly between different code bases. Um, so it's very difficult to know what your, your user is going to do in their code base to handle the exceptions that you throw. So I don't really have any advice for this. It's just that be aware that any changes you make to the set of exceptions that you throw may cause problems for your users. It's another issue for documentation. Make sure you document clearly what the exception conditions are and what will happen in those cases. Type assumptions, because it's a dynamically typed language, um, are slightly scary uh, in Python. So when you switch out one type for a supposedly compatible type, so you change a string for a list of characters, or you change uh, a string for an iterable of characters or something like that, uh, they often look compatible and your test might continue to pass, but suddenly you can't loop more than once because you're dealing with an iterator rather than a, a, a a data type that you can that you can loop through multiple times. Um, so just be aware that these do have different properties, um, and make sure that your either your documentation changes um, to match that, or um, that uh, you don't make the change at all. Really, monkey patching is always a risk. Uh, people do crazy stuff, especially if you find a bug in your code that you don't respond to quickly enough. Um, they will inject their code into your code base. There's not really anything you can do about this. They've broken the deal with you. So it's not something to worry about, but it's just something to be aware of that will happen. There's no silver bullet. You will break client code. I mean, Python is such a dynamic language and so open and transparent that, that any change you make carries some risk. Um, but ultimately, it's a question of documenting to your users what the assumptions are and trying as much as possible to keep to the, that agreement. So to sum up, <laughs> if you want your interface to be strong and stable, um, you need to know what it is, you need to document it so your users know what it is, you need to test it so that you, you're keeping the promises that you've made. When, when you need to change backwards compatibility, you need to communicate that with your users and it's better to do that up front than after the fact. Um, and it's helpful to know some tricks for swapping out code in a dy dynamic language like Python. Uh, so 
I've put, there's a GitHub repository on that bit.ly address, uh, which contains um, kind of uh, more low-level details of some of the tricks that I was showing, um, and the PDF of these slides, if you're interested. Uh, you can contact me on that email address, or feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, and if you see me around the conference, I'm usually wearing a pink hat. Uh, feel free to talk to me about Nexmo or this talk or anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you.